Okay, well, welcome everyone to our first virtual faculty showcase. And um, I just wanna welcome all of you and thank you for attending. And some of you may know that historically, this has been uh, delivered face-to-face -face where you can engage, approach faculty one-on-one, -on -one, talk to them, ask questions. So we are hoping that this format will still allow um, us all to do that. And so just to give you an idea of the format we have, we are, I'm gonna introduce the faculty who were nice enough to participate this year. And then we are going to watch a short video which highlights or features some of the innovative teaching practices that uh, these faculty have been using. And then um, we're gonna open it up for any kind of questions or discussion to um, talk to those faculty members. And then from there, we're gonna to segue to seeing a, a different short uh, compilation of a uh, video of two faculty members who are returning from sabbatical to see what they have been, um, what they were up to on sabbatical and um, some very timely and relevant uh, research and uh, work there. So um, without further ado, I'm just gonna start by introducing the faculty that are participating. Um, first, we have Wilfredo Barajas from Culinary Arts. Wilfredo, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And John Dirsch from Mathematics. Hi, John, you're not on my screen, but welcome. Um, Bill Faber from Physical Sciences. Hi, Bill. Sam Gould from Music. Rachel Lutwick Diener from English. Drew Rosema from Computer Information Systems. And Megan Vandermeil from Mathematics. So thank all of you, thanks to all of you for participating. Um, so from there, I'm gonna allow class to pull up our first video, which is a compilation of um, some of these faculty members and some of the innovative things they're doing in the classroom. So class, if you're able to do so, if you could pull that first video up. As you may have noticed, I've literally run out of places to set things on my desktop. <laughs> when I started reimagining how I was gonna build this workflow, I had the benefit of uh, history in video and television production. So, so I knew there was this gadget called a video switcher. And what it lets me do is it's currently making this, this, this multi-view display, which shows me the program. And this is what is going to go out to YouTube. And the big buttons here let me switch between the different video sources. So when I am talking with students, students see me over top of my desktop. They also can see just the desktop when they're in the Zoom meeting. And it's sending pictures and sound out to YouTube. And it's recording it in real time so that like, I don't have to mess around with editing video or anything after the fact. I also keep a chat window open. So the, the Zoom chat, if I'm trying to murder them with a PowerPoint presentation of some sort, um, I use that usually as the foundation for what I'm doing. I'm a big fan of being able to go through and use this monitor for what's coming up next. And then oftentimes I've got to um, show students a picture of a screen and then go through and draw all over it. This is the place where the files go. I bought these light diffusers, basically just enough so that there's light hitting me. It's not like burning at me so that I don't look like this giant washed out blob. So if you've got good light, you've got a reasonable camera. A good microphone is a great investment. I found an echo canceling speaker. It means that I don't have to wear headphones the whole time and I don't get feedback where the microphone is picking up the speaker the whole time. I can't tell you how important it is in my classes to be able to talk to people and see their faces. If they don't have a camera and microphone, they can't really participate. They can watch, but they can't participate, so I ask them to treat it as though it was a completely asynchronous online class and do the discussions in text the way everybody else does. Changing to a, a, a virtual or even like a hybrid mode, um, I mean, it, it has changed uh, the way that we see teaching, at least in my perspective. I designed this setup to be used in a virtual um, situation. The GRCC media team, they came and they, they produced some professional uh, videos. So then that basically fulfilled the needs of my hybrid portion, those videos. If we had to go virtual 100% online, those two days that we're not in class, those two days were, were gonna be done with, with the help of this setup. We're, we're actually having a, late, a lecture live, I'm doing demos live, and they're cooking live at home. This is how I communicate with my students via Zoom, but then when I do a demo or a, a virtual class, what I've done is I have set up an OBS system 
and I, it, the OBS system becomes my, my camera. So then what I like to do is I like to share my screen with my students. And in my shared screen, I find my OBS camera. Now I have three cameras. It's a um, open broadcasting system, and I quickly realized that there's a lot of like bugs in that system. That's why it's free. This way, I could have a top view, and I could have a side view. I could change the angles as I like. I did a demo, and then the students went, and they, based on my demo, they cooked at home. And it was pretty cool because I was able to see eight different cameras. that They were all cooking at home, and I was able to coach them through it. Learning how to use all of this equipment, it took a long time. It took me like a year. Ideally, this may be a little bit bigger, but it's fine because I have the camera coming on an angle this way, so it, it shows my face. I, I love that this is stationary. I also have my GoPro on the side. Sometimes I do like little demos, but then I also have my microphone right here that I use to do just my lecture. So I come here and I just, uh, I put my PowerPoints on and I start just recording my PowerPoints and I, and I capture my voice and I just do it from here. I actually have instructions for myself just to set it up correctly because I don't use it every day and because I don't use it every day, I, I, I forget. You have to practice, 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 practice. I have so many videos and I have so many lectures that, that have been recorded and students could watch that before coming to class and they're more prepared to ask questions because now they've seen it. They've seen the beginning, they've seen the end and now when they see me do like a small demonstration, now it's easier for them to understand and actually begin to learn. When you have content delivered on video that students can go back to, it just makes learning more authentic. I've become more confident and comfortable with videoing myself and just being a talking head, but there's a limit to how engaging that can be. I got the innovation grant to purchase a program called Powtoon for student engagement. I really depend on little videos to deliver information to my students in a way that is engaging. And there's music, and you can choose characters. I have used Powtoon to deliver just little fun quizzes to my students. There's also options for swapping out images, images that are relevant to our course content. I see that they're accessing the videos. They can report back what they learned. I also use those videos um, for weekly announcements. A good online course follows patterns, right? So students know what to expect from week to week. But within those patterns, I like to um, provide different things to them. I want that variety for them and for me. My uh, innovation grant project uh, entailed the uh, rhythmic system of the Carnatic music tradition of South India. So much of it involves speaking a composition and keeping the beat with a series of hand gestures. This is called keeping the tala. Let's say I was dealing with a rhythm in five beats in a meter of five. Between each finger gesture, I'm going to count four beats. One, two, three, four. 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 Once those rhythms were solidified, we could apply them to any five note musical gesture on the snare drum, for instance. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. This project offered lots of unique ways for me to assign um, different tasks that allowed them to practice at home and solidify some concepts without instruments before they got the chance to come to campus to actually apply those things. Also, I'm teaching Music 110 this semester, which is a music literature course for non-music -ma major students. And when we get to the music of India in the course of our curriculum, 
I have them do a lot of these vocal exercises um, just so they can experience some of these concepts on an elementary level and also, you know, remain in engaged behind on the other side of the computer screen. I have two courses, four sections, three sections of our college algebra and then one section of the differential equations and linear algebra. And so I have about 20 to 25 percent of all of my students in all four sections who have opted to, no, I'd just as soon stay home all the time. Well, I'm using swivel and it's basically something that will follow me in the room and record audio and video and it lets me be me. All of us who teach, we have to do what we're most comfortable doing and yeah, I could sit behind a desk and I could talk into a laptop or an iPad, but I'm a dynamic sort of an individual in the classroom. I have to move around. I have to be able to gesture. I have to have people see me gesture. If I'm going to make some stupid joke, they want at least should be able to see my face and what body language I'm using. So I just needed something that would allow me to be the person that I've been in the classroom for my entire career, and Swivel lets me do that. It's basically capturing pretty much everything I do in the classroom. It's recorded so that I can upload that onto YouTube. I hate to say this because I never wanted to have a YouTube presence, but I, I have over 200 videos on YouTube now that students can view whenever they want. Um, it's not live streamed. It could be, but I was, my decision was that was going to make things too complicated. And so what happens is I have students in a classroom and I teach the way I normally teach and there's a video that's recorded and then I go to my office and within an hour it's viewable by students who weren't able to make it to class that day for whatever reason. Sometimes I think it may be too good because I would much prefer that students be here. It bothers me a little bit that they don't do that, but I guess that's maybe a testament to the fact that it seems to be doing a pretty good job. If you feel that you must teach, you will do whatever you have to do to make it happen. There, there is, I think, a misconception at times that so-called older people just don't want to use technology or they just can't figure it out, and that irks me. I wanted to be back in the classroom. This allowed me to be back in the classroom. Was it always easy? No. If I can learn it, you can learn it. Thank you, class. That was, it's very enjoyable to see everyone in their element. <laughs> so I just wanted to, because uh, we're not meeting face to face, I, I just want to throw this out to any questions, comments, discussion that anyone, um, or you can put it in the chat too. I'm happy to kind of monitor that. I see Kate and Kevin have already jumped in here. Uh, John, I really like the swivel technology. I need to learn more about it. It sounds like maybe John should put a session on through the CTE, right? On how to use swivel. <laughs> Um, and Kate, so-called older people, I love that, John, and I agree, I like the swivel technology. So I don't know, John, would you throw anything out to um, anyone who might be considering it? Uh, how, how difficult was it to implement? If it hadn't been for class, I, I don't think I ever would have done it because there was a learning curve that I would have had a difficult time navigating myself, but with, with him willing to take my questions pretty much whenever I had them, I spent... I didn't keep track, but quite a bit of time over the summer, um, basically figuring out the basics and then doing whatever I could to try to break it so I'd know how to fix it <laughs> if things went wrong in the classroom. And I, I spent a lot of time just stressing it and seeing what worked and what didn't work and what I would have trouble with and what would go smoothly. So it took me a fair amount of time, but uh, it was worth it because I, I won't say it's been flawless, but it's been pretty close. There have been very, very few problems. Good. So if, if, if people enjoy being in the classroom, actually physically being in a classroom um, and with, you know, students, some students present and others not present, being able to move around and, and be active, be dynamic, I, I think it's wonderful. Good, thank you. And anybody else have questions, go ahead and throw them up in the chat there um, for any of our, any of those that were presenting there. Um, my question is to Drew, what is your electricity bill like with the number of cords <laughs> and wires <laughs> you had, Don't had ask set up? my wife. <laughs> your, was yours uh, slightly more complicated than the swivel to set up? Uh, yeah, I, I did swivel for a long time too, though. Though, though It's pretty amazing. Like the, the big benefit of swivel that John was demoing there is that they, they give you this little gadget that you clip onto your 
lapel or whatever, or put around a lanyard and it, the camera follows you. So if you do a lot of teaching at the whiteboard or whatever, you, you know, the iPad follows you around the room. So that was pretty cool. And with my way overly complicated setup here, a all led lights. So I kind of kept the lighting part of the bill down. Um, the, uh, the, I am limited in that, like me and bogey here, you know, we can only be in this space, but I did, you know, spend the money to get a stand up desk so that, that what you're, what I'm really doing is standing in front of this big green tarp that I put on the back of my office wall in order to be able to, you know, not be completely tied to my desk, but still pretty tied to my desk, you know? Um, but most of my telestrating happens or my, my whiteboard work happens on, you know, on a screen. So I teach a subject that, that very um, nicely lends itself to being taught on a computer, right? Yeah, that's true. Okay, um, just in the interest of time, class, do you mind we are going to segue to, um, and there'll be more time for questions, but I do want to make sure we get to our video of um, the, our two faculty members who have returned from sabbatical and see what they're up to. professor in the math department at GRCC and for my sabbatical I studied gerrymandering and voting and the mathematics behind it. One of the things that I that I also did is I followed the work of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. So a lot of my presentation is going to follow some of the work that they're doing and some of what I did and how it relates. I want to focus more on what the students are doing and less on my explanations of things. So, I mean, I still offer explanations and provide structure, but the goal is to have the students do something um, and learn through doing. And so um, that was kind of the reason why I wanted to do more of a puzzle approach rather than me just telling them, you know, this is, this is what it means to gerrymander um, and showing them some pictures of it. I wanted them to try doing the gerrymandering so they could really understand just how extreme we can get with our results. And in doing that, you have to think through the mathematics behind it. One, one component of this is that we have to have equal population in all districts. If you look at this example, so this is one of the puzzles that that you could try on your own. Let's say I'm just doing three districts here. So if I just make this a district, this a district, and this a district. Notice that this district right here would have a lot more people in it than this one, and this one as well. So if you're in a district that has fewer people, that means that your vote counts more, right? Your, your vote has more power in it because there's less people that are, are contributing their votes. If I want to try and be fair, what does it mean to be fair? So how many people do I have in this particular population and how is that going to play out in the maps? I'm going to have to use the mathematics to evaluate that. To meet the equal population requirements, three of these dots are going to have to go somewhere else. So maybe this is going to be one district. And there's 23 over here, so I, I have to decide, do I do this, right? That could be an option. And then these three go with 17 more dots over here. There's a famous theorem called Arrows and Possibility Theorem that has said that there's no completely fair voting system. It does not exist. And so fairness just comes comes down to um, kind of managing what's unfair about it. And so we have to know how different voting systems can violate different fairness criteria, and then at least we know what we're dealing with. Minorities that have cohesive voting interests that differ from surrounding majority populations and are reasonably compact should be given the opportunity of significant electoral power through redistricting. We, we have to give them the opportunity to elect representation. That doesn't guarantee that they will um, be able to receive representation, but, but we have to draw the line so that they have enough voting power in a district so that they could elect um, someone to represent them or um, pass policy changes that affect them. 
you can't just take into account um, proportions when you're drawing maps. You have to take into account population distribution. So how are people living? And that's impacted by a lot of things. It's impacted by economics. It's impacted by culture. It's impacted by geography. Um, and that kind of thing is always changing. So one thing that is becoming clear in the state of Michigan is that uh, the population is really moving more towards the cities, right? And so that's, that's gonna change how we're drawing the maps and how we're making them fair. This one, we're trying to split the map into six connected districts of equal population, determine how many districts each party should win. So you're gonna use some proportional thinking here. So if we're splitting this into six districts of equal population, we're gonna have seven squares in, squares in each district. This might be a nice district for the blanks right here. Let me make a diamond district. Students really get excited about this content. One thing that's interesting is they'll often tell me that they think this is not math. Really math is about structure. So it's about how things are structured and how things relate to each other within that structure. And Numbers is one structure, right? There's a lot of structure behind numbers, um, but there's structure behind everything that we do. And so really expanding the idea of what mathematics is and kind of expanding that to other kinds of relationships between things, I think is really important for students seeing themselves in the mathematical world and then also seeing how um, how mathematics can apply in different ways. So when this name came from students, because when I would do some of these problems in class, they told me they felt like they were doing Sudoku, so I used the word Sudoku and combined it with politics, so that's where Poloku came from. So PolokuPuzzles.com, and then when you go to the different blog posts, I, I write about it, but you can also just go do the puzzles. One of my goals in doing the puzzles was keeping things a little bit more simple makes it easier for students to learn how to do them, and it takes less time for me to explain it, and then they can just get going on it. So the goal is to spend as much time as possible working on the puzzles and less time having to frame it and give instructions on it. With the, the Google Suite, I was able to do pretty much everything I needed. The sabbatical really gave me time to sit with, with some things, and also, if something interesting came up, I was able to follow that and see where it led. It also helped me appreciate, as I was reflecting on some things, it helped me appreciate the value of working with students, because um, they, so much of, of what I was looking at had come from conversations with students and things that I had done in the classroom. For my sabbatical, I worked in a lab at MSU and I did RNA sequencing data analysis. We have built a relationship with uh, Dr. Prokop over the last few years. Once every other week, he would come and talk for an hour to our students and us. The little bit that we were working with him on um, you get a sense that there's something bigger behind this, and I wanted to know what that big thing was. We all know that when you think of genetics, you think of um, DNA can make more DNA. That's how our cells replicate. But then the whole point of DNA is that it codes for RNA, and that RNA actually codes for a protein. Proteins are the things that make chemical reactions happen in our bodies or in any biological system. So oftentimes drugs are designed to interact with proteins to speed them up or slow them down. And so um, this is the central dogma of, of genetics. Dogma can get really complicated. And it can because that, that basic idea that we talk about in a biochemistry class or a biology class that DNA becomes RNA is we know that RNA can go back to DNA. And if we think of what's on everybody's minds right now about coronavirus is that's what they do. They have a piece of mRNA, generate a piece of DNA, and so this is more cyclical in systems than we used to believe. Certain cells have certain proteins that are expressed. You wouldn't want the genes in liver cells being expressed in your eyes. And so we know that genes are regulated. And one of the ways that they get regulated is through this interaction with RNA. These two proteins actually represent this little blob here and this bigger blob here, represent 
a ribosome. And those are actually made of both protein and RNA. And these little colorful beads would be the protein that's coming off of them. And this blue line would be a piece of mRNA. There's all these different types of RNA that are actually involved in this process. There are just so many different ways that RNA is involved in the cell that it would make sense that people study this. And that is, is what I learned at, when I was at MSU. I think it's fundamental research. It's cutting edge you know, science that's taking place in the research labs around us. They, um, to bring that down to um, involve students that don't have as much of a background is something that if I don't have an understanding of it, it's difficult for me to do that. How do you take this raw data that you get, these little pieces, and map them back to what is actually happening in a cell? And so there are programs that you, the free programs to do this work. So you take all these files that have this information and you map them back to the transcript. You don't necessarily have to be in a lab to do what I did. You, there's a lot of information out there, and genetic information has so much, um, I guess it holds secrets to things, and, and I'm gonna show you where you could get some of that information if you wanted to study it. This is big data analysis, so file organization, how to download programs, how to run programs, syntax, and then um, it's kind of those small little victories until you finally get this, oh, now I can show someone how to do this. On this website, you can actually find um, data that has been collected from labs around the world, basically about RNA that has been isolated and analyzed and sequenced. Even if you typed in something like COVID, this shows RNA sequence data and you could click on this and actually download these, um, these files. Well, I, I think it gives me real world examples. I, I get to, when I talk about genetics and talk about RNA and DNA, it's absolutely not the scope of my class to get into that level of depth, but it is, I think, my responsibility to let students know that there's something bigger out there and these, I think I can align um, my content to better prepare them for how complex some of these things really are. One of the things you can do, you can look at, take all these different uh, cell samples and you can do an analysis to find out normal cells versus uh, samples with COVID. All that alignment has already taken place, so all these samples um, ha are aligned to the transcriptome, so you know which pieces of RNA are being expressed and which are not, or being, are present. And then you, you have to do a, a statistical analysis on saying, um, well, is it significant? One of the things I developed early were kind of like 10 sessions I could do with students on, on how to get them introduced to bioinformatics. If you go into fundamental research, you're not going to ever be prepared to, to have all the knowledge. You need to be prepared how to learn so that you can pick up what you need to be successful. Having sabbatical time matters because one of the things you can honestly ask yourself in life about is whether you really know what you're talking about and whether you really understand something. And I know I don't, but I know it better than I did. And I think that that's what education affords you is, I know it better than I used to. Did either of you two know just how relevant both of your topics would be <laughs> when, you, when you submitted for your sabbatical? Um, who could have known? Bill, we were doing interviews today um, for a, a faculty member, and that thing you were just talking about when you were talking about how I, I need to know beyond just what I know was a big topic of discussion earlier. And when you said that, I straight up, like the skin is, the, I got the little goosebumps standing up on the back of my neck here because it was just like, ooh, it is so true. Well, I, 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 I mean, I've been out of graduate school like what 
one, two years. Um, you yeah. know, I've been at, I've been GRCC for over 20. And so it is amazing how um, things have changed in 20 years. And, and we know genetics is like changes tomorrow. It'll be different. Right. Um, but that that is I think what I enjoyed the most was like like having that time to sort of like do a snow angel and all that material, you know, and like just savor it. And so um, it was, it was fantastic. You guys know I chair that committee, like uh, I'm getting all warm and fuzzy here. <laughs> Megan and Bill, any um, advice to those people who may be considering sabbatical? Like, they, you know, I've thought about it, but um, maybe haven't, you know, are, are just kind of in that pre-contemplation phase of whether sabbatical is for them or not. I feel like sabbaticals for everyone. It was it was great. I highly recommend it for anyone. I seem to recall we were going to get a demo at the uh, Book Nook and Java Shop at some point. Am I misrecalling that? <laughs> yeah, I was hoping to do that. Part of my proposal was I wanted to do some um, presentations out in the community because I've gotten a lot of interest from the community, but it was just really difficult with COVID to do that. So I did reach out to the public library and there's potential there. Um, but what's interesting is part of what I did is I planned a seminar that I'm going to be running the first half of the summer. And everyone who signed up so far is just uh, general interest students that are taking it and it's virtual. So they're coming from all over. So there's a lot of um, community members that are interested. The other thing I wanted to mention is class did present a full length um, version of, of, I believe both Bill and Megan gave roughly an hour or so presentation that more thoroughly describes their, their work, if I'm not mistaken. And so we can make those links available after um, the showcase as well. For those of you that were particularly riveted, um, Rachel, uh, so that you can watch it, it, you know, in its full length, so. Yeah, you'll want, you'll want to get on, on the ground floor on watching those because they'll go viral, you know. <laughs> we could, uh, between you two and, and John's YouTube presence, I think we're, we're onto something here. I will, I will give um, one, one thing, IT and um, Drew have been so helpful since I've been back um, just to get a, a Linux system available to continue doing this um, and then allowing students to do it as well. And so it's, it's been fantastic. So. It's that lab you, the, the NSF is paying for. They're getting their money worth out of it. Any other questions or comments while we're all together? This has been so nice to actually see so many of you in action. <laughs> Yeah, thanks everybody who presented. That was just really cool. And I think, you know, from with COVID, I felt so out of it. And it was just a great reminder to me what a great college we have. And like, I don't ever get over to culinary and how cool it is to see Wilfredo with that camera and trying to figure that out. It's just, that's just very cool. Thanks everyone. Wilfredo, how many times did OBS crash on you? Uh, actually, several times. And, <laughs> I mean, there's a learning curve. So every time my OBS crashed, I wrote it down, like what cost it. And so I knew exactly what to do and what not to do. So I knew that if I plug something in first or second or third, it was going to crash on me. So um, it was it was pretty interesting. But um, I, I actually had the switcher that the one that you had, I bought it too. But it was uh, way, um, uh, it was too much for me to handle. It's like I, I just sent it back. I was like, I don't have time for this. So, but yeah, I mean, it was a great learning experience because we here, we cook for a living. We don't really deal with um, media like that. Or, so there was a, definitely a, like a big learning curve for us. And it was a challenge for us because we're so used to cooking. I mean, face to face, we have the students in front of us. It, it is, it's more like a coaching game in a way, cooking. You have the student in front of you and you coach them. You show them how to move their body, how to taste food and it was very difficult for us to to try to do this via online virtually and using technology i know there's a lot of stuff out there um but uh, not all of it is great i really had to like really uh think about how i was going to present the information 
what was relevant, what was not, and also how, how to assess it, you know, how to, you know, connect the dots very, very well. So it was a challenge. And so far it, it worked. I, we had a great year over here. At least I could say that for me, I, I exceeded expectations. Uh, I think I exceeded my expectations. We went above and beyond what we would do in a normal class. I mean, I know that all of you know this, it was a big challenge. And I think we're all looking forward to, to, um, to, to being done with this year. I think that's a, the very, a very nice way to summarize. Uh, <laughs> summarize. Um, so we are gonna make this recording available. I hope to share it with the campus, all of the campus um, with some of my announcements out from the CTE. Um, unless anyone has other questions or closing comments, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of extra time here um, with, I think I had scheduled this 45 minutes. So I think we're running a little bit short on time, but um, any, Laura, any other closing think, comments? Yeah, just, just very quickly, it doesn't have to be a closing comment, just really great, impressive work. Um, I, I mean, you know, you're all, I knew you would do great work seeing all of the different ways you've continued and engaged students and the great work on the sabbaticals. I'm so glad I was able to, to set this time aside um, and join you. And if there's this type of technology, especially the stuff in the classrooms, use for your classroom, if you have ideas for continued use of that, sooner than later, let us know. We, you know, there is funding available. We can put some of these things into use beyond the, the pandemic. So it's, it's just really impressive to see. And I want to thank all of you for, for continuing that work. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I think there's a reality show in the making here. I think we need cameras following John all the time. <laughs> And we, it's a great, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Real mathematicians of Grand Rapids. <laughs> yes, that, that would break the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just like to say, Dr. Gold, that I was a music minor in college, but I, I had a hard time that I, I, I got to review that. But very cool stuff. Very rhythmic. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. I just want to say a special thanks to the media wizard himself, Class Quant, who was behind this. All I did is just facilitate it. He put all, he did all the heavy lifting. So class out there, thank you so much for this. This has been really nice. And I look forward to sharing it more broadly with the campus too. So thank you for joining us. Good luck on the home stretch to everybody. We'll see you sooner or later. Have a good day. <laughs>